Canadian. I'm Canadian too. Hi. Um, oh gosh, Kim's joining us from Melbourne, Australia. Fantastic. And Becky from Salida. Hello, Becky. <laughs> uh, this is fantastic. Thank you all for being here. This is really exciting. Um, and uh, so just a reminder, um, this session is being recorded. So if for some reason uh, you lose contact with us or have to leave early, you can come back and watch the recording of this uh, video a little bit later. Uh, so I now want to take an opportunity to just introduce our fabulous guest speaker here with us today. Um, Dr. Carmen Patrick Mon is an internal medicine physician joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, she is so much more. She is a marathon runner who qualified for the Boston Marathon in 2016. She's a mother of two. She's a caretaker of six chickens, which is very important. And, um, and, and Carmen's relationship with running goes way back. Um, I've met her more recently, having attended uh, two retreats with us uh, in years past in Iceland and the Italian Dolomites. But long before that, uh, she competed on uh, women's track and cross country teams at the University of Maryland. And now she's the CEO and founder of Hello Health, an executive women's health and wellness program. Through Hello Health, Carmen provides programs and services to equip, equip women with skill sets needed for resilience as they pursue their professional purpose. I love this. She's a graduate of Emory University School of Medicine, and she's a clinical fellow at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Carmen uses food and exercise as medicine in her own life and in the lives of her patients. So through her practice at Hello Health Clinic, Carmen presides, uh, provides a concierge physician services for women in leadership. So we're so lucky to have her here with us today to share her wisdom and expertise with us. She's also, I'm so proud of her, she's also uh, the author of a, a great book called The Women's Guide to Health. Uh, the Run, Walk, Run Method, Eat Right and Feel Better that she wrote in collaboration with uh, Olympian Jeff Galloway, who's here on this call with us today, and the Emory Professor um, School of Medicine um, prof professional, um, Dr. Ruth um, M. Parker. So, oh my gosh, so much expertise with us here today. Um, I am so excited to have you here and thank you and welcome, Carmen. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. This is just fabulous, Eleanor. That's great. Well, uh, so Carmen and I know each other having run uh, together at a couple of retreats. And I've just always been fascinated by your approach to to women's health and fitness, especially as a physician. And one of the things that I, I love about your approach is, is you know, one of your mantras is that all health is personal. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you mean by that, first off. Absolutely. Well, now that we're being inundated with health information due to the pandemic, for example, everyone's internal dialogue has been dialed up in this new way, I think, that we're all very cognizant of. So it's really hard to hear health information and not think, how does this apply to me? No matter what I say, what I'm saying here today is a general idea. It's generally things that help, but there's no substitution for your own doctor's advice and for what you know to be true for yourself. So what I mean about all health being personal is that as soon as we start talking about any health topic, from blood pressure to COVID-19 to running and wellness, everyone has what they bring to the table in their own personal experience and how we're feeling emotionally, what we say to ourselves as our default changes based on who we are. And so as you listen to me, a physician, talking about anything that I talk about today, know that if you hear a negative voice or an inner critic, it's probably not totally right. And there's probably a much more neutral place that we could go with it. So if you're feeling anxious or afraid or ashamed, those are all things about health being personal and needing some personal advice around that area. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I love that you, you point out that we are being so inundated with health and wellness information these days. And, and that's something that I'm hoping to, to kind of simplify for us today in this conversation is how, um, 
you know, we don't need to take in all this information, but how do we determine what is going to be useful for us individually? Um, and one of the things that I hear come up uh, from a lot of runners is, is just the, the, the effects of, of stress in our lives these days. And unfortunately, that's never been so acute as it is right now in the situation we're all in right now. And um, so I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, about the role that st stress in general plays into um, just how, how we should approach our health management. Sure. Well, right now, while leaders in particular who feel like they're running through fire, um, what they're dealing with are kind of categories of stress. So the first thing I would urge everyone to do is to really name what you're feeling stressed by. And generally, the categories are fear, because there's so much uncertainty, and we're playing for really high stakes, right? Sometimes we're playing for people's lives, right? And then there's grief for what we've lost, and we realize just how good our lives used to be. So when I'm talking about stress, we all need to be really good about naming what that stress is. Just naming it helps give us a way to get other people involved to start to mitigate against how, just how severe that stress can be. So when, when you talk about the role of stress in health, I think that it becomes, it gets out of control if you don't have a good Oh God. The next thing would be I think we may have a certain future. Did you lose me? For just a oh, moment. No. Yeah, but you're back now. I'm back now. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm so sorry. If you wouldn't mind backing up just briefly with your previous comment, we'd love to hear that. My again. comment was around stress management, uh, being a part of health. Um, can you hear me now, Eleanor? I'm sorry. Yes. Um, that stress management is not the same as being familiar with stress. So, you know, knowing that there are techniques that you can learn to manage each category of stress is very helpful for me and for my patients. Right. So just to, so just to review, you were saying that really naming and identifying the kind of stress or the, the, the type of stress that you're feeling um, on an emotional level can be helpful for then determining the best uh, type of stress management yes. approach. Yes, absolutely. And in Hello Health, we're saying that we need to use the body to help the mind, because as you as we've pointed out here today, the cognitive load due to new information that needs to be processed so that we can make the best decisions for ourselves and for our families is really high right now. So we need to not just expect our minds to be able to turn off from our grief and our fear. We need to start to use our bodies to help our minds calm down so that we don't make fear-based decisions, but rather decisions based mostly on our values, since what we know so far today is uh, actually not that much. What we have is a lot of expert opinion. Yeah, I, I really want to zero in on something that you said there with how um, we can use you know, you zero in on what's happening in our bodies to help us process like the mental stress, because there's, mm -hmm. there's so much emotion and it can be hard to untangle the emotions of, of that, that come up as a result of the stress, because there's a lot of things to be concerned and worried about right now. Um, and so that's one of the things I love about mindful running is it is a practice that is very about really getting into the body and, 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 and how that can really, um, help us de-stress. And I know that you, you as a runner, um, the running plays an important part in your own um, self-care and, and, uh, and stress management routine. I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about what that's like for you. Well, Eleanor, I have you to thank for that. You taught me how to mindfully run. So before uh, we met in the retreat, I believe it was the Iceland retreat, I had never used my breath while running as a way to um, for stress management in particular. And so it was actually listening to some of your mindful running audio that mm -hmm. taught me to breathe deeply while pushing some of my 
uh, physical limits. So I would just suggest to you that some of the things that you've taught me and that you've taught women on your retreats, like the, the deep breath like this one, where you really down low in there, that kind of breathing actually activates the vagus nerve, which runs along our esophagus, all along um, beside our hearts, actually, and is compressed when we breathe deeply because our lungs expand. And when we hold that breath, we've inserted a pause into our physiology, and that pause helps our minds and hearts slow down. And so the emotion becomes easier to bear, and it's a part of coping that we can use cognizantly without just requesting that our minds slow down or feeling out of control with whatever it is that's really stressing us out. I, I, I love having your explanation of that phenomenon as a physician to really <laughs> help us understand that there's like a real physiological response that occurs in the body that um, that it's not just something that, well, I know I feel sort of better. After <laughs> run, but I don't really know why, like there's a real physiological change that happens. So thank you for describing. Oh, you came to that by a, via intuition and trial and error, I yeah. think, but it's, it's actually quite brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And um, I, uh, we were able to, to go deeper into this conversation. If anyone else is interested in, in, uh, breathing um, if for managing stress. I highly recommend checking out one of our previous speaker series events with um, Emily Hightower, um, which can be found in our speaker series archives. So just want to mention that. Um, so yeah, so so that's it's so true. The, the more we try to slow down the thoughts, it seems the more they just speed up or we get more caught up into them. So then focusing on breathing and using mindful running as a tool for, for getting into the body and out of our heads can really help us manage that, that stress. Uh, that and stress can I say just a little more about that phenomenon? Yeah, Excellent. That. So when you're running, if you're mindfully running and you're using a breathing technique, what's really cool about it is what tends to happen is your heart rate is up just because you're moving your body. But then when you breathe and you're actively slowing that heart rate down, and your body is still keeping that same pace. What you start to teach yourself and to learn is that even though you feel pretty stressed, you're coping pretty well. And it begins to expand your growth edge in that way. So it, it's something you can practice. The more we think about these teachings as a skill set that we can learn, the better off we'll be. So I know that you use set your intention before a run. Before meeting you, I never did that. But as I started to set my intention, I realized that part of the magic of self-care and stress management is making conscious the things that actually make you feel better. And when you say to yourself, I'm doing this just for me, I'm actually doing it so I show up in my values, that's a piece of self-care is also a piece to stress management. And it's so nice because you know that you can use your body to help your mind and that your mind is going to calm down by the end of that run. It's so nice, isn't it? Knowing it's going to work. Yeah, I, I love it. I love it. Oh, that's it's so that's so beautifully explained. I love it. Um, for those of you watching with us live, if you have a specific question um, about how, uh, you know, about this topic that, that, do you want to post to Dr. Carmen? Go ahead and post it in the chat, uh, or you can click on ask a question down below, and we will be taking questions uh, throughout this call. Uh, so in the meantime, Carmen, I have a question for you in, in that, um, uh, you know, I, I consider myself a leader with a lot of responsibility in terms of running a business and, and leading retreats and, and trying to juggle that role with my role as, as, as a mom and, uh, you know, and a wife and, and, you know, juggling all these different responsibilities. And I've in the past, one of the things that led me to even start running mindfully in the past was an extreme case of burnout. Um, that I found really devastating where I, I couldn't function at all. And, and since having gone through that experience and talked about that with other women, especially women in leadership roles, women in business, women, you know, with careers and, and are also very busy and, and that sort of thing. 
that, that it's not such an uncommon experience that I had. Um, and, uh, and, and like, like, uh, we all experienced, um, it's really hard to be a, any kind of a leader when, when you're in that place of just burnout or exhaustion. Um, and, and you're not effective, uh, as a leader because it's so hard to make decisions or to show up or just have the energy. Um, and I've heard you say that, that, you know, health is a leadership strategy. Mm-hmm. And, and so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what that means in terms of, you know, how taking care of ourselves helps us be better at showing up for other people. <laughs> Absolutely. This is my wheelhouse. So first of all, let me just say, Eleanor, thank you for sharing your story. So many women believe that they're alone and being completely burnt out. And we say, oh, I'm burned out. It's not the same as what you're describing when it's actually hard to share that you're in that space and feeling alone makes it even harder. Um, So I just really appreciate that you share that story and uh, tell others about it. One thing that sometimes jugglers, so within the Hello Health framework, we have a system for self-care and we actually have um, self-care prescriptions that we ask women in leadership in particular to do. Um, You're describing the phenomenon is often experienced by not just first responders, the women who run around putting out the fires both at work and at home, but of the juggler. So much quieter hero, the one who everyone comes to and knows that their needs will be met, um, no matter which domain of your life, whether that's personal or professional, that woman is functioning in. It's a different kind of leadership, and those jugglers tend to have a lot of empathy for others. That leads them to put themselves last. And so what you've experienced, at least the way I explain it within the Hello Health framework, was an absolute tap out of your resilience capacity, where you actually definitely burned out, not being able to function and do the things that you needed to do and show up in the way that you wanted to is is the definition of burnout. So protecting one's resilience capacity is a skill we all need to learn. And jugglers need to learn that one in addition to you're alone You need enough alone time to do what's good for you, but you also need to not feel alone within that experience. And so there's two different skills that we would ask a woman who would be finding herself in your place, running her own business, maybe you're newly distance learning and and your son is like in your space now and you're the one who takes care of the sudden dramatic shift in your personal world due to external events that are completely out of your control. And there's a stress to that. It goes unnamed, it's often hidden, because these roles are often taken by women. So when I say health is a leadership strategy, what I'm asking all people in leadership to do is not to separate yourself in these uh, these strange ways. You know, I I actually don't believe in work-life balance, like there's just your life. And there's the work that you were called to do and the people that you want to show up for because they're the ones that you love best of all in all the world. And so there's using health as a leadership strategy reminds you that no matter where you are, your holistic health is part of it. Um, One way, for example, to honor health and be a leader, because very often the people you are leading need permission to actually do what's best for them is to take that lunch break and be eating while on teleconference calls or take tea time and say, hey, it's, it's tea time and get together with your group of people, for example. The fact that you're pausing exhibits good stress, stress management, especially in the middle of a really productive time when we all want to be going, going, going. Demonstrating that and modeling health as a leadership strategy is, is that's kind of the flair of where I'm going with that adage. I love that. Mo- uh, modeling health as a leadership strategy. Mm-hmm. Yes, I love that. Let's mm-hmm. let's remember that, folks. Um, I'd love to hear from any of the, those of you watching today. Can you relate to to any of the things we've been talking about so far in terms of um, feeling stressed to the point that, that it made it hard for you to to show up or to to do your work or to to be there? Um, 
or have you felt some of the, the physiological effects of, of higher levels of stress um, more recently? Uh, what, what has your experience been um, uh, in your lives? So if anyone has a question or experience that they'd like to share, go ahead and pop it in the, in the chat box. Um, but uh, I, I just find this really wonderful, especially, you know, thinking about uh, so many of the, the women runners that that uh, that I've met and um, and, you know, how they describe running as being such an important part of their of their lives, like more than just, say, running to to uh, to do races and be social, which is wonderful. Um, but it's so much more than that. There's another layer of meaning to running as part of their lifestyles. And, um, and uh, so I, I'd love to hear, you know, like how like you, you, you are, are an example of one of those women, you know, in terms of juggling this business and, and uh, you have a podcast, the Hello Health podcast and a family and, and, you know, how do you fit running into your busy lifestyle? You know, you said that you don't believe in work-life balance. There's just <laughs> your life. So <laughs> I don't know. We're, I guess I'm hoping that we can kind of glean some. Uh, so uh, some methods that might help the rest of us also like find a way to fit in uh, when we're juggling all these different responsibilities. <clears throat> well, so running is part of my identity and running fuels my soul. And so my whole family knows if I've got a training program because it's on the fridge. And as a result, I tell them during family meetings, look, all of us have our needs. We're going to create a system for our family where all of our needs are going to be met and we'll get some of what we want. And each one of us gets some of what we want, but everyone's needs need to be met. And when I make sure that there are some consistent rules and my own needs are on the table and I've labeled them and I tell my family, they can be quite supportive in making sure that run is something that fits in there. And sometimes my daughters will come with me, which is really always really nice. But Here's the thing, Eleanor, I've been a runner for more than 27 years at this time. So there's never been a Sunday that my kids remember when I didn't go for a run unless for some reason I was hurt. So, you know, and why was I hurt? Because I overdid it, right? And I didn't actually stick to my own system, which includes rest and recovery as part of it. So knowing that it's not just the running, but also the resting and recovery that are part of my needs. It's very helpful for me to remind my family sometimes to actually slow me down on purpose. Very, very helpful. So I guess what I would say is some strategies that are helpful to me and to other women who are in my clinic are number one, to make sure that everyone actually, if you're a family person, everyone actually knows what everyone else's needs are, especially where it comes to having enough time alone. And that time alone doesn't always have to be spent running, right? So that the run is just, that's just good self-care. That's not the same as, as having good quality time by myself. Um, those are two things I, I need and they're different from each other. So a lot of women will say to me that they're using exercise and that's their alone time. And I just find it really sad that we're not expanding that definition a little more widely so that we don't have it like razor, razor sharp Discipline is the only kind of self-care we experience. Um, you know, when you're juggling, very often there you have values that you're willing to exchange for restorative energy. And I would just say that restorative energy happens inside of solitude, stillness, and silence. And that's one thing that escapes women who are juggling the way you and I do when we're business owners and, and really leading in our families as well. Um, everybody needs stillness, silence, and solitude. And it doesn't matter that you've got all of these things that you think are valuable juggling up in the air. Um, if you don't let the people who are the most meaningful to you know what you need in those three categories, it will never happen. So back to naming what you need in addition to what you're afraid of, I think, um, is something to just be cognizant of. Very often, the jugglers don't actually know what they need. They're so good at identifying what everybody else does. 
And, you know, it's kind of one of those hidden stresses of women, I would say. Um, so in that case, if that's, if that's kind of where you are with that, I would ask you to really expand your backstage area because very often you've got really good friends who you've cultivated deep bonds with who can tell you what they are. You just have to ask. So make conscious and tell people when they're people that you trust, that they're part of your backstage crew, that they're part of your support bench so that they can let you know what you need so that then you can tell the people around you. That's what I would say. I, I love that. And um, I, you know, something that you, you said really jumped out at me as well is just how we all need a certain amount of, of stillness, whether it's like stillness of the body or stillness of the mind to really support kind of that, that recovery and that rest process that we all know. I think a lot of us as runners, we understand the importance of, yes, I need to rest because that's my recovery time and my days off or my recovery but how busy do we get on our days off of training? Like perhaps, you know, we're taking a day off from running, but is it truly a rest day when it's filled with so many other things and there is no room for stillness there, you know? Um, I, I, I really I really think that, that that's something that's really hard for us as runners to, to embrace when we're so like used to just like, go, 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 go being productive on multiple levels at the same time. And, yeah, one and, of the reasons we go into running is because it's so efficient, such an effective form yes. of exercise. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> totally, exactly. That You get so much done super quick. And then as soon as you, you get back, you just like jump right back into work. And I'm constantly- Guilty, I'm uh, guilty. Yes, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that today, in fact, I was going to stretch and then I'm like, no, I got to put yeah. for, the, for the speaker series. And uh, you didn't take that time to just like, hey, let's, you know, spend a few minutes recovering from this run before returning to work. But, but the, I think that even finding those little moments of um, transition or like stillness between activities you know, can really be beneficial overall. Uh, if anyone watching has, um, you know, experience with this or, you know, want to share with us ways in which you find little moments of, of, of stillness or quiet throughout your day, uh, we'd love to hear about that. Um, there's one, one other word that, that, um, that I see come up a lot in conversations about what makes a great leader and I see it come up in your work as well. And I'm really curious about this concept of resiliency, you know, and I love the sound of that because it, it, it implies to me that a leader is someone who um, is resilient in that they can, they can take it, like they can take a lot of the pressure, they can take the stress and still you know, still persevere or still, um, you know, get things done. Um, but at the same time, I feel like that can be a slippery slope and can lead us to uh, uh, exhaustion and burnout. Um, so I, I would really like to get clear on what stress resiliency is and, and, and um, how do we cultivate more of it? love this question. It's so fantastic. I think we could talk about this for the rest of the time. So I think it depends who you ask about this. What I mean when I refer to resiliency is a more of a resilience capacity. And the leaders tend to have certain things in place which really help with resilience capacity. With resilience, I mean you can endure stress and bounce back to a, a sense of high energy, a, a sense that you, you're able to tap into a wellspring of personal energy and use your body as a vessel for feeling um, like really fueled and ready to go so that you can leverage your unique contributions, right? So that you can really make cool things happen in the world. And that that is a resilient person because if you're trying to make something happen, everyone knows the obstacles come your way. And resiliency is your responsiveness to that obstacle, whatever it may be. Within the running world, I would say resilience is being hit by a car and finding a way back to running when it takes years, when it takes years. And we've seen that happen with all kinds of athletes that demonstrate resiliency. Sometimes it's 
how strong they are with their mindset. Sometimes it's their will to believe. But that kind of resiliency has its place in leadership as well. So we all have a certain capacity for how much energy we can experience at any one um, point in time. And our bodies are part of that resiliency. Very often, runners, runners who have overrun before really understand that when you've stretched yourself too far, you've, you've overdone it and you lose it. And after you've lost your resilience, you really start to get a handle on what it means. So, Eleanor, I'm, so, I'm sorry, but I think you may have experienced that. And you probably know just kind of in your bones what it really means now. So in terms of how to enhance a sense of resiliency, stress management is really key. And involving other people in different dimensions over the course of your life will really start to lead to enhancing that. So within the Hello Health system, for example, we try to move leaders away from this idea that you can be or should be self-recharging. When we think of a, the idea of like a battery and how charged up you are, if you run over to go put out all these fires that are so important and it takes you and you only, you know, and you don't do something for yourself first, like breathe oxygen, you're gonna run into this burning building it's going to be literally like on fire. You're going to be breathing smoke. You'll have to hold your breath and you will end up on the floor, right? Talk about burning out in some sort of real way for a first responder, right? So you don't go running into a building without putting your own oxygen mask on first. That's kind of like what I mean when you start with one thing and you can sort of pause into your day so that you can breathe and say to yourself, this is one thing for me and it's going to keep me going. So resiliency has a lot to do with the systems that you have in place that make sure that you are taken care of so that you can maintain the stamina you need, whether that's in a run or over the course of your career. Yeah, gosh. I mean, I, I, I love that you touched on the idea that a lot of us as runners are probably familiar with and what, how that relates to the, the stress side that we're probably less familiar with. I think as runners, um, and, and this is something your, your colleague Jeff Galloway here could probably speak to, is, is how as runners, we're, we're in, taught about how to recognize signs of, of overtraining. Mm -hmm. how when, we're, when we're training too much, you know, we, we, we are taught to recognize that in terms of like, oh, your muscle soreness or your low recovery rate or, you know, elevated heart rate in the morning and that sort of thing. And, and so, so there's a lot of talk of like being able to recognize the signs of overtraining as a runner, but not necessarily like recognizing um, just when uh, we're lacking overall stress resilience, meaning like the stress of training combined with the stress of you know, all the other things we were talking about earlier in the, in the call, which is just the life stress and the, the underlying anxiety that's prevalent right now because of what we're dealing with these days um, and how that can accumulate and, and, and it can manifest, I think, in ways that are very similar to say overtraining. Um, but it, you, you, that can occur for someone who's maybe even not even running very much. And I think that that's really important to, to recognize that, that, um, that yes, running can be that great stress reliever, mm -hmm. but in those times of, of accumulated stress, that it just can, adds to the stress load, right? Yeah, Eleanor, you're really nailing that. You're really nailing it right now because the body doesn't recognize the difference between good and bad stress, right? Mm. It's all just stress. So, you know, you're thinking that, okay, running is supposed to relieve this stress, so I'm gonna run some more because I'm so stressed. And all you're doing is adding to the problem, right? It's the way that you approached it, that's the problem. So um, like the body doesn't say this is a good stress, exercise is a good stress, and you know, this emotional toll over here and this worry and confusion is like a, a negative stress. It's, and they don't cancel each other out, they build on each other. And as soon as we start to understand that a little better, I think to your point, well, we're all just going to be breathing more easily. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so when you were talking about like really cultivating our stress resilience, we we're talking about you mentioned systems, like having mm -hmm. systems in place 
uh, that actually help us become better at, at, at stress resilience. So I was wondering if we could dive in a little bit more into what are some of the, the common systems that, that you recommend for the kinds of people that you see that, that, that we as runners could, could also use to help us? Absolutely. And, and Jeff, you know, I just have to shout out to you before we march into this question around athleticism across the life cycle. I really appreciate all the ways that you have made sure we start to recover and to use recovery and rest days in our training. And I especially appreciate the coaching you've um, allowed for me. It's really helped me. So one of the reasons, those of you who are here today, that I'm really trying to highlight the role Eleanor has played in my running career and the role that Jeff has played in my running career, making it possible for me to run the Boston Marathon. The, the, I rely, even though I'm an expert in physiology and how the human body performs, like literally I have been the research assistant inside a human performance lab. And yet, because running is so important to me and I plan to run to 100, which Jeff gave me that goal, by the way, I, I use other people. I do not expect myself to come up with my own training programs. And I don't always run by myself because the presence of other runners has always helped me. And now I run in a virtual environment. So if I can rely on other people as an expert in my, uh, I'm, I'm masterful inside this domain and I still rely on other people to take care of me in certain ways, then you can too. So on with like, you know, it, it's not humility. It is a system right? I'm relying on other people to give me input to make sure that I don't overrun again and again and again, because I'm often under quite a bit of stress. And running is very often my outlet. So the things I'm talking about, I know firsthand, um, and I just love the sport. So I want to be around to be able to do it for a long time. And that's when I learned to develop a systematic approach to my own health. And that's when I learned to help my patients um, in theirs. So, Eleanor, you're asking for what is one of the common systems for people to really invest in their own self-care. I would say that there are common steps, but of course, all health is personal. And so there's like, there's what I'm going to say, and then there's how you're going to fill that step that will be really unique to you. So I alluded to do one thing for yourself first thing in the morning. Um, the systematic way of thinking is I'm going to enjoy one thing today. It doesn't matter how great the need of everybody else is in my life. It doesn't matter how big and pressing or urgent the tasks I need to perform are. And you know, you see me, I'm in scrubs right now. I didn't have time to change for this interview. And Eleanor seems to really just accept that that's where I am right now. That's how little time I have. And yet I do one thing for myself first thing in the morning. So that's step one. What could those things look like? If you don't have a lot of time, like really, you're really pressed for time, I recommend those three big breaths because that's just seconds that you took for yourself. The magic in self-care is just being conscious and telling yourself, this is, this is for me and I feel a lot better. This is enjoyable. And to take the time to really enjoy whatever it is. One of my colleagues, also a physician, at a time when we were working 80 to 100 hour weeks as a matter of course, uh, for years, told me that on her way home from work, what she would do is buy cheap lipsticks. And she would just try on cheap lipsticks in the morning. And you know, it's fun. It's There's no productivity to it. And it was just for her. So like I said, it can be three quick breaths. It can be a new lipstick shade in the morning. And it didn't take you even a minute to do one thing for yourself and that you feel better. So this can look like a cup of coffee, one of my patients likes to be out on her deck. She sets a timer for 10 minutes and she listens to the birds as the sun rises. So, you know, I hear you, you're up before the sunrise, you don't have a lot of time and you've got your priorities. And yet all of these other women who are pretty happy and smiley do one thing for themselves first thing. The second thing that I would say is you really need to bookend your day. So the reason you need to bookend your day is so you can protect the restorative power that is sleep. So our bodies don't just help us when they're in motion. They really help us with emotional processing when we obtain restorative sleep. So to book in your day, what you're gonna do is write down one win for the day. 
one win in any part of your life. And while I'm anti work-life balance, other people think of themselves like in terms of the hats that they wear. And so it doesn't have to be just one thing. I'm just asking for definitely one thing. If you write one thing down that was the win of the day, you downshift, you stop acting like you're a light switch, right? So you're not an on off switch. Don't expect yourself to be able to just be able to go to sleep. Oh, now I need to sleep, so go to sleep. I mean, this doesn't work. If, if you can do that, that's pretty awesome. I'd love for you to teach me. Instead, you really need to start to be a dimmer switch and honor the fact that that's just how our factory installed equipment works. So the one minute of the day takes your eyes off of the future where none of us knows where that's going to go and all of that uncertainty and puts our minds in the past that it's pretty positive. You, know, you go to bed thinking, even though there's like a whole mountain range to scale with a tent on my back, this one thing got done and it's pretty cool. And you put your eyes on progress, which is so important, I think, for runners. Like those three miles, however many miles that got done, you know, then at the end of the month, your mileage starts to accrue and it feels really great. Well, I'm just asking for another kind of win in any other domain. At the end of your week, you'll have seven wins. That means single most important things are getting done and you end in this way that allows you to get and consolidate beneficial sleep. So another thing I always tell everyone to do, and this is just the beginning of what we're asking for in terms of a systematic approach to your own self-care and using health as part of your leadership strategy, not just running, but your whole self. Invest in an eight hour sleep opportunity every single time you can. So for my colleagues who oftentimes cannot sleep for eight hours consecutively, I do advocate naps. So I advocate a total of eight to nine hours of sleep as you can. And if you're running really far, like the way Eleanor likes to do with the marathoning and the ultra marathoning, you know, that nap after you're done is something, it's your way, your body's way of actually repairing itself and part of recovery. So starting to be sleep as part of your recovery plan is really important. If you bookend your day the way that I'm asking you to, you will start to sleep in a much more deep way. And you'll, you'll start to see over time that I'm right. And it didn't take you a whole lot of time or discipline or planning. It just requires a little bit of consistency, which all runners are great at. That's awesome. And, you know, so what I love about these these tips that you're offering us is that it helps support us not only as runners to, to, to perform better and recover better, but also just as humans, you know, it helps our whole health. And, and that's, that's what I love about these things is that they're so fundamental, even though they can be elusive at times, especially at the pace of life that, that we're trying to sustain um, these days. Uh, but what a great opportunity this is, this, this, the great pause that we're in right now to, to maybe reorganize some of those priorities and find more time for, for the, the self-care qualities because of the huge impact they really can have on our, on our lives as well as our fitness. As well. You know, they sound so simple, don't they? Mm -hmm. And it's not rocket science, but yet like nobody's doing it. And it may be because it doesn't seem complicated enough to be effective. And I would just say, you know how that really humble person in the room is often the most brilliant. It's kind of like how these are, you know, just try them out and see what works for you. And then come back and tell me you'd like to go back to your old ways. No? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, that's amazing. Uh, well, I, Dr. Carmen, in case anyone else wants to or um, wants to find out more, uh, just hear more of your your beautiful wisdom and and insights and and just reassuring, clear messages that that I have found incredibly helpful and inspiring today. If, if people want to hear more from that uh, from you from the Hello Health podcast, can you tell us a little bit more about that? About where people can find it, sure. what kind of people you have uh, on the podcast? Absolutely. Actually, um, right now we have running Self-Care for Leaders Under Fire as a series. And in that, I am talking to women across the country doing amazing things. So in terms of first responders, one of my, my dear friends, who's an emergency room physician now, has come on and 
done an interview so you can really hear what self-care looks like even when you're literally on the front lines. If she can do it, we can all do it kind of a thing. But women who are industry leaders across the nation, some in New York City, especially some marketers, some running small businesses, a lot of women juggling new babies and young children while running businesses successfully from home. So they, we run the gamut right now with our interviews. Eleanor, I hope you accept my invitation to come and be one of those women um, leaders under fire interviews. I'm really excited for that opportunity. Oh <laughs> but if you'd like to hear kind of just what real people are doing, you know, it's like real talk. And I promise it won't scare you. And I promise it won't feel overwhelming. And I also promise that you'll leave with action steps at the end of every episode. If you did just one thing after every episode, you'd feel better. So it's about feeling better today. And you can find us anywhere you get your audio. What you have to do is smush the words hello and health together as if they were one word. And we pop right up on most search engines. The name of the podcast is Hello Health, then the space today anywhere you get your audio, or you can just um, go to our website, which is hellohealthtoday 